Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's 3M Health Information Systems webinar. My name is Katie, and I'll be your host. Today's webinar will explore how to leverage HCCs to manage risk. Let's get started. Today's presenter is Cheryl Mintenton. Cheryl is a senior inpatient consultant with 3M Health Information Systems. With more than 24 years of experience in clinical documentation improvement, Cheryl specializes in program management for multi hospital EDI engagement, including process design, redesign, and change management. We have a lot to cover today. I will now turn the presentation over to our presenter. Cheryl, you have the floor. Thank you, Katie, and good afternoon, everyone on the East Coast and on the West Coast. Good morning. Um, we're going to start off nice and early with a polling question. So if you would go ahead and launch that. Thank you so much, Ms. Katie. Um, as we're talking about HCCs today, I think everybody kind of knows they're a big deal. But let's make sure that we understand the basics of how they are, what they are, how they work. Um, we'll talk about what some of the pitfalls are. And then most importantly, again, how can we strategize both as an inpatient, outpatient, and professional um, world. Um, kind of another thing to think about is this is sort of the opposite. It's not that CDIs and codings are um, hurting quality with their questions or, or their coding, but in this case, did they realize all the extra things that they could do to actually help um, HCCs, again, in that um, in the work that we do every day. So our goal is to make sure that we understand that we can't live in isolation and just do our jobs without knowing how it's affecting the big picture. Having said that, Katie, will you go ahead and share the results, please? Or close the poll. Yeah. Above. Thank you. <laughs> so 38% answered yes, 32% answered no, and 30% I don't know. And I have shared those results on the screen as well. Great, and I can see those. So I think this actually is probably the most um, representative thing that I still see as a challenge and where sometimes I get frustrated that we're not understanding that it is also an inpatient problem and that our CDIs aren't also thinking about HCCs. Our inpatient coders aren't thinking about them and going after them. So, you know, it's like, oh, well, if it does something for me for the DRG and or severity mortality, the fact that it's an HCC is a bonus. But if it's not doing either one of those, then I'm not going to, please pardon me, my air quotes, waste my time. We need as an organization to do that. And again, we'll kind of um, hopefully flush some of that out on the WebEx today. Hey, Cheryl, sorry to interrupt. We've had a few people comment to see if you can turn up your mic at all. Absolutely. Thank you. I will speak much louder. I always sound like I'm shouting when I think that I'm not, when you all say I'm talking normal, I feel like I'm screaming. So I always appreciate somebody saying speak up because I, I never think I'm loud enough. Okay, so um, let's talk about this shift. You know, we used to live in a fee for fee, fee for service world really in all of our settings, whether it be inpatient, outpatient, private practices, own practices, et cetera. Um, of course, what is happening is there has been a goal for CMS and the industry to really move to value-based reimbursement and to have at least 50% of all patient encounters be paid under a value-based reimbursement model. That in itself was kind of a change, but of course, more so, they are, they're expanding even further to say they want, you know, 75% of every transaction, shall we say, or every bill that, the payment that we're doing for patient care be actually tied to quality. So there's really only going to be a small percentage of patients that will really be old-fashioned world fee-for-service world. Now, I, I know many of us are saying with the political situation with healthcare right now, how certain are you that we're going to stay in this world? Well, I can't imagine us going all the way backwards to fee for service. I, I think that that is a, for some, a pipe dream that isn't going to happen. You know, I, I think that we'll be in some sort of quality payment world, whatever it might be. So, 
uh, you know, again, we need to be thinking a little bit more globally uh, because of that. So again, we're going to start off with just some basics. What are HCCs? Um, of course, HCC, I'm going to pronounce it one time for everyone, hierarchical condition categories. And again, hierarchical meaning that certain diagnoses, if they're in the same group or the same condition category, that we're only going to get counted for one of those. Okay. And again, as a reminder, they were developed by CMS for risk adjustment, originally for the Medicare Advantage program. How do I know how much it's going to cost to care for my patients? Are all my patients going to equally use the same resources if they're 76-year-olds, as an example? No, they're definitely not. Risk adjustment is kind of one of those buzzwords that we need to think about, and it is a process that takes into account the underlying health status and the health spending of our enrollees in insurance group, and really looking at their outcomes or costs. And again, as you see, it's a healthcare.gov official glossary definition. But like I said, thinking risk adjustment said all patients aren't created equal. I know some 96-year-olds that are extremely active and are lapping me at the track, where we know some other you know, 70-year-olds that can't even walk a block. So risk adjustment says their cost of care and, and their risk of good or bad outcomes really need to be stratified or adjusted. On a simple view, when we think about um, that ratio, that risk adjustment, we're looking at a numerator um, and divided by the denominator. So, of course, math still plays into, into key all these years later, and that gives us our ratio. Okay? And again, as the slide is kind of building here for you all, you will see that the hospital A has a 0.0013 mortality rate, right? And hospital B has that sum. It says, okay, all of our patients are exactly the same and have the same risk of mortality. Well, we know that's not the case. But what if we factor in a couple of other things, such as one of the hospitals is located in an affluent suburb, they do a very large volume of L&D, and they have access to some really nice, healthy foods, where Hospital B is in an underserved population, right, where they don't have all the resources that they need. Uh, they're in a rural setting. They have lots of diabetes, lots of MCCs, and again, some of their food choice options aren't the best. You know, sometimes I think it's frustrating when I'm traveling, I'll be in a, a some small towns and the only choices I have is food, fast food, and that's kind of frustrating. Are, are both of those patients uh, the same? No, they're not. Okay, so again, I'm trying to build this next slide here. Uh, when CMS was talking about what does, should CMS need to use or bank or set aside to take care of their members, a, you know, an average number would be an 800 per month payment, okay, meaning it will cost $800 a month to care for that patient, okay? And for the Medicare Advantage program, again, to say that they all they should have the same amount, should they have a lower amount that they need to spend when it's typically a healthier population and a little bit lower risk, are we underrepresenting the first group and maybe overrepresenting the second? We need to risk adjust those. And of course, you know, uh, they needed a way to uh, risk adjust those uh, that payment to make sure that they weren't paying the same for all. Um, in the ideal world, assuming that your health year over year is exactly the same, it would be a good predictor of future cost. And the assumption in that is that your chronic cost conditions are really those that are going to predict future cost because something that is uh, a transient acute condition like a sprained ankle is probably not going to predict future costs long term in the next few months, baby, but not in the next year. So if you think about the same example that we did before with the numerator and the denominator, the same numerator of observed cases, but the denominator, instead of being total cases, it'd be expected cases. And if you look at our same two hospitals, A and B, and again, needing to risk adjust them, it's going to be through those diagnoses, okay? Now, I do think that sometimes everyone thinks about HCCs only being for the Medicare Advantage, so why do we care? There are many um, more places that HCCs are used. 
Okay, so our RAF, our risk adjustment factor scores, are multipliers for our capitated payment or our premiums for the Medicare Advantage programs. Okay, that's the easiest one that we understand. Second place that they're used is in that hospital pay for performance, and it's an indirect. Okay, it is risk adjusting our value based purchasing, um, and it's a, affecting our our cost our cost control measures, our readmissions, our hacks, et cetera. Okay, it's setting those expected rates through these addition of these diagnoses. Third place they're used is in an ACO environment where we're trying to share the savings or share the risk. Again, it's an indirect. It's going to risk benchmark. It helps us set reasonable targets. What should be our targets for cost savings? And what is our risk of not achieving them? The, the problem is that it can be a downside risk for our alternate payment models, but certainly these HCCs are factoring in there. And the place I think that sometimes our physicians would like to forget would be our physician payments um, that was legislated through MACRA, through the Merit-Based uh, Incentive Payment System, MIPS. Um, those HCCs, again, are risk-adjusting that physician's population to show why their costs may need to be what they are based on, again, the, the complexity of care of the patients that they're having. I know there's a lot of discussion out there, well, is MIPS dead? Is MIPS going? Does it matter? Well, in the meantime, we're still having to live in this environment until it is officially legislated out or modified. So it's still a factor. And then finally, um, you know, there are some custom applications of HECs when the payers are sharing incentives uh, with, the, with the hospitals. Um, and again, actually one of the places that I'm at right now that they are only in a cost sharing uh, model with one of their insurers. So uh, definitely a factor. So again, I'm going to kind of build this next slide in advance as it's popping in as we talk about that because I know we're a little bit of a late delay here. When we talk about um, that risk adjustment payment reporting, our value-based purchasing model, under that total performance score, um, if you'll notice, that there's a 2% DRG reduction, and we're putting that money into that incentive pot and hoping to make that 2% back and maybe a little bit more. And again, it is based on the measure performance, which includes the, the domains that you see listed, the five domains, and understand that the clinical care outcomes, the safety, and the efficiency, which of course I know a couple of these have merged, so we're really down to four domains, um, these are all risk-adjusted through HCCs. Now, over on the left, on the right, excuse me, as you're kind of looking at this, what's going on with the current world? What happened? The top performing hospital did get that a 3% increase. So not only did they get their 2% back, they actually got 3% above. Um, uh, as you can see, a little over half had minimal impact, uh, whether it be plus or minus. And the, the worst performing hospital had about a 1.7% decrease, okay? Now, when you look at the kind of bottom left of this section, the change in the VBP payment adjustment, as you'll see is there were um, about 1,300 hospitals that got worse on their, their payment adjustment and some got improved. But when you look at the, the dollars, um, it, it wasn't quite as dramatic as it seemed. Most of it is based on the fact that, again, how they kind of fell out in a hierarchical way. You know, in other words, because it, you only have X number of dollars that you know, all the hospitals put into the pot, that has to be redistributed. So sometimes that redistribution did not always help some of the hospitals that maybe in the past had had better performance. Okay. So to kind of repeat again the RAF and make sure that we're all using the same terminology, RAF is the risk adjustment factor. And it's similar to a CMI. It's sort of a reflection of your patient's severity of illness. It, of course, is not a direct measurement of payment. It's the how well are we or how much are we having to risk adjust our negotiated rates for payment based on the complexity of patients. And again, for an individual patient, it's um, all of their diagnoses adjusted for their age, their living arrangement, whether it's community-based or, or uh, institutionalized, and then whether or not they're disabled. And of course, again, the average um, RAF score for a hospital is all of those patients' RAFs. 
So I like this kind of example. So this patient, Mr. Paul Smith, is a 78-year-old male, community-based. He has some chronic conditions, and you can see that in 2017, as this builds, the following HCCs were reported. He had diabetes with retinopathy. He's morbidly obese, has arthritis, cardiomyopathy, and COPD. Okay? His overall score, when we also got an extra little multiplier for the disease interaction between CHF and COPD and the diabetes and CHF, certainly got some extra weight. And his total RAF score is 2.520. Okay, so what happened the following year? Well, let's talk about this year, actually. Sorry, let's do this math. If the average payment is $800 per member per month payment or allotment, you multiply that times that RAF score of 2.25, I mean, 0.520 to get your payment, right? And that is what that provider or that organization is allotted to spend for that patient in a 12-month period, okay? So let's talk about this patient again as the slide, whoops, I went the wrong way, forgive me, but there it goes. So let's look at that same patient. Last year, his RAF score was 2.520. This year, Dr. Smith only documented in face-to-face -face encounters his diabetes and morbid obesity and did not address the other three. Now, I would agree with some of you. Seriously, the doctor would not document the dilated cardiomyopathy? Maybe not. I'd hope he documented the COPD. Maybe he didn't. Um, you know, maybe he only went to his endocrinologist. Maybe that was his only visit that next year was to that physician who only documented the parts that pertain to his specialty. If you'll notice, our total RAF score is much, much lower, and we are missing some reimbursement for some chronic conditions that we should have had. And again, if you measure that out and that RAF score being that much lower, you can see how much less what we're making per month and, sorry, excuse me, and um, that ultimately when you multiply that out times 12 months is where you'll see that we are now um, severely getting a big decrease in payment because we didn't capture those HCCs. And so, Katie, if you'll go ahead and launch the next polling question, please. Thank you. So um, as we're kind of starting this polling question, and hopefully it's a quick question for you, um, I think part of our challenge is, again, do the physicians. We think our physicians are, well, we talked about HCCs once. Oh, they've been told extensively about HCCs. Okay, they know what they are, but do they really know how it impacts them personally? Have they seen the impact of that? That's something that we need to think about. Um, and when what we're going to kind of transition to, um, as Katie is letting this poll finish up, is really talking about what does this look like in a, a multiple hospital healthcare system, the where the struggle is and where maybe they're not leveraging them. So if Katie, you could share the results with me real fast. I just shared those on the screen. 24% answered yes, 29% no, and 47% I don't know. Now, see, what scares me is the 47%, right? That actually scares me more, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, certainly the 29% the is even scarier, meaning we are definitely haven't done it yet. I'm glad for the 29%, but I, I think that this really still shows we have a lot of room to grow. So thank you. Okay, so if you'll notice and kind of bear with me, these 433,000 patients and change um, in 2015 and 2016, I know it's a little bit older, but I think it's a good illustrative example, is you'll notice how many, how many visits they had inpatient, how many they had outpatient and professional. And of course, the bulk of these, as we know, is definitely professional. And that's been a trend. And you'll notice it's pretty flat over time. We had an increase in patients, inpatient visits, but um, overall, we did not have a net change that much, okay? If you look at the RAF score, it looks fairly flat from 2015 to 16. So why do they look bad? That, that looks pretty good, right? Percentage of patients with HCC is about the same. Now, I don't think our patients are really the same sickness every year. I think uh, as someone who's been in healthcare almost 30 years now, the patients are, are living longer and they're living much sicker 
And I do think it's incrementally um, so every single year. What scares me is what you'll notice is if they, you know, if all things were equal, what diagnoses were underreported? What percentage of patients was there a missing HCC? 26%. That's a fourth of my population that we underreported. And of that, what you see even scarier to me is the number or percentage of HCCs. Um, that had been underreported and how that translates out. As you'll see, our RAF score was really almost half of what it should have been or could have been had we captured all those HCCs. And, you know, that 91%, I know it feels a little inflammatory, but again, remember, you're risk adjusting your population, you know, for all of those settings, for all of those programs. And if we're not capturing them, we're really not showing that risk adjustment. So, I, this is one healthcare system, certainly, but I don't think it is misrepresenting the whole population. Okay, so kind of moving forward, where were the gaps? So looking at that same sort of population, 54% of their visits were had only an outpatient encounter, 16% had an inpatient admission, Mind you, those inpatient patients could have also had one of those other visits. 20% were an only physician visit, and unfortunately, the ones that, of course, frighten us are the 8%, almost 9%, who had none at all. Where the gap in your HCC programs can be in this area that if, you're, if our CDI program is only focusing on an inpatient, that uh, we're only getting 16% of our population. So there's definitely room to grow, whether it be finding those 8.5% patients, getting those patients actually seen and treated, not just for our RAS score, but, you know, for their clinical care. You know, that's certainly um, an opportunity. And when you specifically focus on the physician-only visits, many times um, those physicians are doing their own billing in their office. They're not having a code of review. They're really more focused on their CPT scoring and uh, they're really not using that computer-assisted coding model to really get that full reimbursement. Okay, now, this is certainly one payer, but what happens when we take it to other payers? And I think that this really is very de demonstrative as well, as you see, Medicare, Medicaid, and then commercial. You know, the, the um, no visits of Medicaid is much higher, of course, than the Medicare population, which I think, again, kind of demonstrates that population. You know, the same thing with commercial. Uh, you know, they tend to be healthier, so they only go to the doctor when they need help, shall we say. But what you will see with commercial is a lot more of those are only seen in that outpatient profi setting. They're not even seen in a clinic setting. Um, so know that the HCCs are not just for Medicare or Medicare Advantage. Many of the commercial payers are using them and, you know, Medicaid, again, as well, to really risk adjust our population. Okay. So, again, think of these annual visits and coding that chronic disease. Inpatient DRGs, of course, diagnosis-based. We're looking, we're reimbursed under MS DRGs. Outpatients is service-based, and we're reimbursed on APCs. And physician visits are service-based and also and, uh, reimbursed under CPT. So we have basically three types of reimbursement or based um, evaluation, shall we say. You know, so again, we have either three poor areas or three opportunities in terms of really getting that reimbursement. And it is our, our opportunity to really make sure we're coding or capturing that chronic disease burden. Uh, this next slide, again, when I saw this statistic, really kind of blew me out of the water. And what you'll notice across the bottom is we pulled out four of the diseases, okay, four very common chronic diseases. And in the same population that we've been looking at, you'll see that diabetes was not re-diagnosed or re not re-documented 55% of the time um, in that second year. That's that's crazy. You know that we're missing that much of an opportunity on some things that we know typically they're, they're a chronic condition for our life. It's not something transient, not a transient chronic disease. Um, so we really are missing a, a sincere population. 
even more so uh, interesting to me is when I started digging into the data. And you'll notice I have both a mix of both Medicare HCCs or commercial HCCs. Um, and what you'll see here is there are some very, and I picked these on purpose. I mean, if you notice on the far right, that's the percentage that were actually re-diagnosed. So that means most of the time diabetic retinopathy is not being re-diagnosed, which is very frightening to me. Or just capturing something as simple or the physician documenting something as simple as being a ventilator or trach dependent or that hemiplegia, this drug alcohol, or chronic ulcers. I mean, these are sort of the meat of a chronic disease population that we know this is why these patients are very frequently needing chronic care is because of these conditions. And to see that this is the percentage of of being reported in a second year, these are these are there's just no excuse. You know, this is this is our opportunity as an organization to make sure our physicians understand. You know, and, and I know some of us on the inpatient world will say the physician will say what do I care? I just read a record where a CAT scan uh, found central lobular emphysema or central lobar emphysema and found multiple chronic compression fractures. None of that was captured by a physician in a way that we could code that. You know, definitely both of those would be HCCs and are reportable. And the physician, the patient came in with sepsis, the physician say, what does emphysema have to do with this? He's septic due to UTI. Probably a lot more than we realized. And, you know, in terms of the chronic fractures, this patient was um, actually chronically bedridden, obviously, due to his stenosis and his fractures. That is has a bearing on, on his health and his status. So, you know, we have to help them understand it's not about today's visit. It's about the patient globally. And there's just really no excuse not to get the physicians to repeat these conditions. When HCCs came out, uh, there was a lot of debate or discussion about um, do, does diagnosis specificity matter? So what you'll see is kind of division. On the top half, these diagnoses, it doesn't matter how I say them. Getting the diagnosis on the record is sufficient and the specificity is not needed for HCC scores. Now again, we know that some of these will increase our severity of illness with more specificity or a risk of mortality or need to be documented more specific for um, medical necessity for admission, as an example, or for medical necessity for treatment and for therapies. But from an HCC score, most of these did not um, matter. And as you'll see, is there's some patients on the, on the right that were just not getting everything that we could on our malnutrition, okay? But the ones where diabetes, what that, excuse me, that the specificity does matter, the type of diabetes, uncomplicated diabetes has a lower RAF score than diabetes with complications or getting the type of pneumonia. The more complex pneumonias um, definitely uh, impact. What type of renal failure? Many times I don't see CDIs even uh, wasting their time, again, please forgive me for saying it that way, to query for the stage of CKD because it doesn't matter. You know, but those stages four and five are HCCs. So, you know, we need to get that on the record or, again, maybe there's confusion. Maybe the record is inconsistent. Is it a three? Is it a four? You know, making sure we're getting that documentation in the record and, of course, um, getting um, the, the more complex pressure ulcers, some, the, your basic stage one pressure ulcer is not an HCC, uh, but stages three and higher certainly are. And again, notice that, note that there are different HCCs for acute versus chronic conditions, um, such as uh, diabetes. There's different categories for those as well. Now, I do have to, um, as we transition to the next slide, I do have to put a caution. They can't just die, put their, die, their HCCs on the record and we pick them up and move on. Um, you know, meet criteria is certainly what we need to do. It needs to meet, meet criteria, okay? It needs to be monitored, evaluated, assessed or addressed, or treated. We need one of those four things um, for us to be able to report that and for us to be able to compliantly capture that. And again, for the physicians to build for that in their professional billing as well, right? For them to be able to change the complexity of their E&M levels, they're going to need to make sure that their diagnoses or their HCCs have enough meat. 
Um, and as you'll see, as I'm kind of referencing at the bottom, if you want to read more about this, there's an excellent blog uh, from Kelly Long that really talked about uh, meat. And I love how she says meat is even better when it's well done. Um, and again, uh, I like Inside Angle, even I as a 3M employee. I like to see what my other coworkers are, are writing about in different parts of our industry and seeing what's trending, what's going on. So if you've never signed up for it, it's a great place to um, to check out past articles or topics. It's also, uh, we do have some now podcasts that we're doing, and one of these definitely uh, is on HCCs as well. So there's multiple opportunities to kind of navigate and browse around Inside Angle and see if there's anything that interests you or uh, if you want, get a free subscription like I do, and I just get my little invites every month, uh, every day or two or three times a week, really, and, and kind of look through the articles and see if it's in, of interest to me. Um, so what are some co common value-based concerns for healthcare systems adjust risk adjustment? First problem is we're not really capturing our hospitals, our population's disease burden. We're, we're not getting the whole picture. And if we're under-reporting, we're not going to get paid for that full cost, or we're not going to be able to risk adjust, and it's, we're going to look like a cost outlier. And the question to the physician is really, are you telling the full story of your patient? You know, we need to make sure. And are you going to trust the other providers in your organization or the other visits, the other settings are going to do that for you? Our second uh, common concern is really, as we is clearly demonstrated in our poll, that the physicians don't really understand them well enough. They're not using them well enough because they don't understand them well enough. And even in our inpatient setting, you know, I'm not going to waste my time on an HCC. We've got to get past that mentality and understand that I struggle with that sometimes, even in my daily work. I, I need to go back and think about that. Am I missing something? We really need to make sure that we um, really talk about some policies and some training. And of course, um, that calculation might even change the way we code or submit those claims to ensure we're getting that. Um, that the third really common concerns is there really is not that CDI process, and I don't mean a CDI reviewer per se, but the whole process of documentation improvement um, happening in the physician office, because as, as we noted, a lot of that patient care really does occur in the physician office. Um, you know, I don't know if you're like an, anyone else, that, you know, they're in and out almost like a factory because <laughs> they've got a lot of patients to see and their documentation tends to be very limited because they just don't have the time to do it. Another problem is many times our physicians are documenting in several different systems, so we're not getting one longitudinal care record. We're getting a snippet here and a snippet there. We don't know what has and hasn't been documented. And again, they're typically those physicians are just not fully documenting that full disease burden. And then finally, um, again, the, the, you know, we're still struggling on predicting those costs. It's like, how do I know what we're going to, how do I negotiate next year's rates or capitated payments if I really can't anticipate those costs? You know, we need to be able to predict that so we can get into a, a good um, cost sharing agreement or a shared savings plan. And really, we, we need that to stratify, and we need to also find which patients are at risk. Those with those higher risk RAF scores, they're my most vulnerable population. They're the ones that probably need me more uh, more so, um, and, and understanding which ones have the higher RAF scores, I might want to do more f frequent surveilling, and being able to see that and measure that gives us that ability to find those at risk patients. Again, some more kind of common gaps or key steps is in that phase to understand that the, the diagnosis has to be done in a face-to-face -face visit, whether it be hospital inpatient, outpatient, physician office. It does exclude our patients that are in hospice, SNF, home health, or a freestanding uh, surgical center. Um, you know, and understand that sometimes we have patients that don't have HCCs reported or don't have visits scheduled. I don't know if any of you read my blog a couple weeks ago. I'm one of those bad patients. I'm probably two years behind on just my normal visit. So my organization is not capturing my HCC RAF score because I am I am the non-compliant one. Um, and they, again, they don't have a good way. No one is bothering me saying, hey, haven't seen you. 
you haven't come back, you need to come back for your visit. There's not a really good process to really know who's not being seen. Um, second thing that the common gaps and key steps is making sure that the uh, provider is addressing and diagnosis the conditions. Remember that we can capture by provider, it can be a physician, a nurse practitioner, a CRNA, a psychologist, psychiatrist, but it does exclude our cost our, our, uh, that we're going to spend for our durable, durable, sorry, durable medical equipment or lab costs or radiology. Um, and for Medicare, it also excludes drug spending. Now, for the commercials, it does include drug spending. Um, and again, when your EMRs are disconnected, the physicians really doesn't, might not have that full picture. And because of that, that's where we're not getting your full HCCs documented and captured. And then finally, um, you know, what diagnoses are actually captured in a claim, right? Um, remember that each HCC has to be submitted on a claim once in that calendar year and has to be support, supported by associated documentation. Um, and again, make sure that, that we're really putting a process in place. How can we enable our physicians? Can we say, listen, we're vested in your success and you as a, your provider success and working with our organization. Can we have someone, a coder, come in and review to see what's not being captured? You know, okay? But remember, those ACC have to be treated, documented, coded, and again, by treated meaning meeting one of the meet criteria and build at some point point in any of the, the care settings. So what should I as a CDI or coder do today with HCCs? On the inpatient side, we ha yeah, we have to follow the coding guidelines, but that also means we have to report all of the conditions, not just some of them are not just good enough. We need to do complete coding, okay? We need to query for additional documentation clarification when it's appropriate. We've got to move into a holistic review of our records to make sure that we're showing this patient's full experience in any of those settings. We need to find what are the common, commonly missed HCCs in the population. You know, what are the ones that physicians aren't documenting? Um, one of my clients in Mississippi once, they weren't documenting even obesity. Because so many of their patients were, it was just a matter of fact for them. They weren't thinking about it because it was basically on most of their patients. That's what the, the CMO of the hospital told me. You know, but what in your patient population is being commonly underreported? That's where we need to educate the physicians. Don't forget to document your amputation status or your trach status. We've got to start treating HCCs like CCs and MCCs. They are as, as important. Now, again, I as a CDI might be a little frustrated because how do I show that ROI? That's not my worry. My worry is what are we doing as a CDI program? We're looking for complete, accurate, and compliant documentation. And that complete part is the, is the piece that we're not always doing. And then, of course, a little extra flag and reminder. We need to, do, to watch that problem list. The problem list is a problem. Of course, we've all heard that joke. But making sure that that problem list is accurate or if there's diagnoses on there that are only on the problem list that don't have that criteria, Maybe they need to be pulled down into an active list and make sure that we've gotten them. In the outpatient professional setting, what should we do? We know, again, the same thing, making sure that we know the diagnose-based coding rules. We need to make sure we're following those and capturing. Um, some of our outpatient audits, the information was there. The physician did um, justify, document, evaluate that condition and we weren't adding the additional modifiers or, or codes that we needed based on that level of care or those associated comorbid conditions. So making sure that we're following those coding rules and again, not under-reporting. Uh, certainly be part of the education. The providers have to get the with them, you know, and that doesn't apply only to outpatient professional, but you know, because some of those physicians might not might only be working in the outpatient setting, we have to make sure that we're reaching out to them and educate them um, certainly, as we said before, we have to pay attention to meet criteria, especially in outpatient professional 
um, because again, for us to capture those diagnoses, it has to you know be a confirmed diagnosis and meet that criteria. Um, as, as I said before, we don't want to undercode any of our diagnoses, and making sure that the diagnosis uh, we have the correct diagnosis links to our H, uh, HCPT. I can't talk. Sorry. HCAPS and CPT coding as well, so that we do have that good connection so that this record will stand up for scrutiny. And most importantly, I can't stress this enough to all of us, including myself, we have to keep learning because your HCCs are not going away. Um, if anything, they're expanding. I know with a lot of the other quality programs, you can question whether or not they're hanging around. I don't see or heard anyone in the industry saying HCCs aren't going to be utilized, so we can't just be the ostrich and bury our head. Okay, What should the organizations do with HCCs? We talked about individually, how do I help myself? As an organization, what can we do or should do? Should do? This first one I can't emphasize enough. HCCs are everybody's problem. I recently in, interacted with a client. They said, we have it fully under control in our outpatient and our profi settings. I am not worried about HCCs of the inpatient. Well, number one, what if that was your only opportunity to get those diagnoses? Number two, what if I could get a more robust record because I have more physicians touching that patient during an inpatient stay than maybe they would in a private setting? We need to have everyone focused on them. Certainly, as I've mentioned many times, um, in the today's session, we need to think about a holistic CDI program. The industry needs to move there. The industry is moving there. Those that aren't doing it are going to find that it's going to hurt them long term. You know, they're not able to see that downstream effect. We need to first of all look at all payers. If you're not doing all payers, you, we need to do all payers. Whether or not we're going to get reimbursed on that or whether or not I can measure an impact, that's still a population that is being risk adjusted. And of course, making sure that we're looking completion of documentation versus impacting only. Um, certainly expand CDI programs into the outpatient and professional profi settings. We need to educate our providers, help them understand. You know, it we have been threatening, cajoling, warning physicians for years. Oh, your professional fees are at risk, your fees are at risk. And it was sort of an idle threat for many of my years in CDI. It's not a threat anymore. You know, come March 31st, when the submission date for our first year of MIPS data has to be submitted by, you know, and they're then from, you know, March into July getting their first reports out, that's an opportune time when they've been given their information. Um, either your ACO report out or that physician's MIPS report out when they're able to see what they're going to look like or what they're looking like. Yes, we're in sort of this uh, trial year. But, you know, this is the time to start the education when they're a little bit more open and receptive because they've just um, learned either they're doing well but they could do better or they're really not doing well at all. Uh, software is definitely a good friend. Software helps us streamline and organize. It helps us identify the patients that we're missing, that 8% we we're talking about. Software can show us those patients that who haven't had a visit finding those who are more at risk and making sure that we're getting them in and looked at and cared for. Um, the software can help ensure that we're capturing all HCCs or showing us which HCCs weren't reported. Um, and again, soft, some software tools will certainly prompt the providers, here are your unaddressed, undocumented HCCs this year. Would you like to address these? And, and software can definitely aid that physician to make sure they're not missing anything. And kind of, again, as a reminder, we really have to expand our programs to ensure that we're getting uh, or we're being part of our organization's full um, reflection of the care that we're giving and uh, the best performance under our quality payment programs. One of my clients uh, that I've been working with this week was discussing their readmission scores don't look that good. They've been working tremendously on the clinical side, and I said, Okay, well, then we need to work on the risk adjustment side. We need to get more of those chronic conditions, which incidentally are HCCs, to really show and, and adjust that risk adjustment for your readmission. So, you know, we we do and have a way to play a part in 
if our population is going to be sick and we've done everything we can to make them compliant, then we really need to do that risk adjusting. Um, and, and again, of course, 3M does have uh, an advanced CDI transformation program, which does involve people, process, and technology. Uh, we certainly have inpatient revitalization and quality services. We have an outpatient professional CDI programs. Uh, we have custom HCC services. We certainly offer, as you can see, some outsourced coding. Through the process, um, we've got the software tools to enable your process and, of course, the technology with the uh, patient insight suite specifically on HCCs that will really, again, try and help find those at-risk patients and to flag or surface those HCCs and do some prompting the physicians to get those in the medical record. As I said before, we do have an HCC solution set which involves uh, training and tools, whether it be starting with an assessment, really looking at your claims, what, finding out what is your percentage of underreported HCCs or missed HCCs, you know, where are your gaps, um, you know, doing just a claims analysis plus a medical record review and then working with you to help train your own staff, your provider staff using uh, the software, uh, certainly as a gift and then the computer to go to. And then finally, again, in that monitoring, help you sustain uh, and or grow your HCC program. And then finally, of course, we do have, you know, quality services to educate on more than just HCCs, a full quality education program, um, uh, both for the staff and then for the uh, physicians. Uh, I'm very proud of our physician quality education. We really uh, make sure that instead of talking about the money for the hospital, we talk about the quality programs and HCCs and MIPS and why it matters to them. As a quick advertisement, um, please save the date for July 17th to 19th, our 3M Client Experience Summit in the lovely Salt Lake. We did move it to the summer uh, because it was so close to a couple of the other conferences. So it's halfway between AHIMA and ACTUS, so uh, you know, that trying to make it a little bit more accessible for everyone. We're really looking forward to it. There's some great topics already that I know that I'm looking forward to attend. Um, the notifications for the registration should be coming out here in just the next few weeks. So Watch your inboxes and please feel free to join us. Share it with your colleagues in, in IT and compliance and coding and quality. There's lots of different tracks, uh, lots of different things for you all. And then Katie, if you will uh, go ahead and open the poll and then uh, we'll move to the QA portion. Yeah, while um, we're answering questions, you'll see the question on your screen to give you the opportunity to learn more about HCC services, quality services, or advanced CDI. So yeah, if you would, wouldn't mind responding to that while we answer questions, that'd be great. So the first question we received is, how can our CDI program measure ROI of querying for HCC? Right, great question. So. I think what's important here um, is to think about from a um, from a quality perspective. If we'll say that quality can measure their value-based purchasing scores and their hack reduction scores and their PSI ratings, why can't CDI also claim that they are part of that HCC score? That you know that that particular category in value-based purchasing that affects their cost and their efficiency quadrant and or their um, readmissions or their mortality. We should be claiming as part of what we're doing. You know, we can't claim 100% of that, but saying that's us too. And, and, you know, this is my own me too movement. Why aren't we also using those metrics and then measuring those metrics and, and showing how we are influencing them as well. So again, it's not that I'm going to give you that dollar by dollar, case by case, because HCCs don't work that way, you know, and, and risk adjustment for readmissions doesn't work dollar by dollar or case by case. It's that setting that risk adjustment in advance. So I think looking at your official program metrics and saying, what is our denial rates, our, you know, our negotiated rates are looking good this year, all of those things can really help you. Okay, the next question is, how do we find out what are the commonly missed HCCs? How do you find that? So that is the, 
the kind of fun part, there's really a couple different ways. One is really a chart review. You know, you got to put your fingers in there and, and look longitudinally. Say, what were the claims on this patient last year? What are the claims on this this year? Do that data analysis. Um, if, if you don't have that data team to do that or that, that depth of, of people, we have that. That's something that we actually do is we can do that on, you know, those two or three calendar years and give you that uh, potential missed revenue. The other piece is having the software tool that is looking, you know, part of when we install the software, we're also um, building it or filling it, supplying it with several back years of data. So it is looking back through those uh, previous couple years and it is telling the physician and surfacing the physician, here's what's being missed. So a couple of different ways. Okay, the next question is, can you code a diagnosis that is noted in a problem list such as hyperlipidemia when you see a current med list showing that the patient is taking a statin medication or does the provider specifically have to address that condition that day? That was an mouthful, so let me know if you want me to repeat it. Oh, no, I got it. No, I'm, I'm okay. good. And you did a great job because I understood it. Uh, it depends on the setting. So understand, in the inpatient setting, it, it meets the burden of monitored, evaluated, treated, extending, you know, it's treated, the medication's continued, so it can be captured. I'm not as well versed in the outpatient world whether or not they're going to have to specifically identify that diagnosis. Many times what I will see um, in the inpatient world is they'll just list two or three chronic conditions to say continue home meds. You know, I've seen them say it that way, you know, making them even more reportable, but I, I am not as well versed on the outpatient uh, documentation requirements to capture it. And so I, I don't want to say something that I can't speak to. But we can follow up with that individual person. I can get someone from the outpatient world to answer um, that capture in the outpatient setting. Okay, does morbid obesity need traditional meat criteria or is the BMI alone enough to justify the diagnosis? Oh, that's a nice tricky one. I love that question. Um, it, so obviously the person asking this question is saying, you know, we've gotten denied that it doesn't meet reporting criteria. It's not monitored, evaluated, treated, so how can you capture it, right? And I have been in the middle of one of those denials with one of the commercial insurers myself. Um, one of the strategies I actually saw one of my clients doing is dietary is actually making a note saying here's their diagnosis and counseling is not appropriate right now for this patient. In other words, I'm evaluating and I can't educate them. They're actually having their dietitians put a note in, which that's the first time I've ever seen it. And I thought that was actually kind of fascinating. Uh, but from my standpoint, um, an inpatient setting again, does it increase nursing care or resources? It does. Does it increase the complexity of care? It absolutely does. So it does meet from my criteria, shall we say. It, it meets my burden of capturing because having taken care of the patients, using the different equipment, needing the extra person to come in the room, you know, ensuring that patient is safe, uh, you know, those are certainly worthy of that criteria. And many times it's easy to find that evidence, but even in the lack of that evidence, it, it just goes without saying, and the commercial payers just really need to get over themselves, because that's typically where I'm seeing the denial. Okay, in your opinion, do you consider HCCs the prospective payment system for physicians, or will it be APGs or something else? That's a great question. If you repeat it one more time so I can chew on it. Yeah, um, so do you consider HCCs the prospective payment system for physicians or will it be APGs or something else? Great. Okay, I want to make sure I heard it. Um, that's kind of a complicated question and it's asking me to put my, my, my crystal ball in front of me. But what I will say is remember HCCs are not a payment system. They are risk adjusting your population. So they're not how the physician is ever going to be reimbursed or should be because that's not what they're utilized for. Um, I don't believe there's any um, 
movement to move around from APCs or CPTs for physician reimbursement. But remember, the HCCs are justifying the APC and the CPT payments. And I think that that's where we have to kind of change the paradigm a little bit and saying, no, 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 I'm just explaining to you why I'm spending what I'm spending or charging what I'm charging. I kind of actually think of them as a savings plan. So if I'm going to go on vacation, I need to put so much money aside. The difference is I'm just telling the government, hey, here's the money that I needed to use or that I'm going to use next year and here's why. And my goal now is if I put and I demonstrate to the government or the payer what my perspective, <laughs> my potential uh, spending is going to be next year, then I am staying within my means and I'm spending within my means because I've justified it. Okay, next question is, how does the HCC process affect state Medicaid that is paying under APR, DRGs, and EAPGs? Oh, another good question. Wow, you're, you're all throwing me some good ones today. Um, the state Medicaid also measures and, and looks at the hospital's reimbursement and the hospital charges, right? So the same thing, we're risk adjusting what the state needs to set aside for their Medicaid payment and to measure those hospitals' efficiency and quality. So the states are using those regardless of the payer they're using or payer payment model, whether it's APR DRGs or MS DRGs, the same uh, um, rules kind of apply. It's risk adjusting and setting those expected rates. The other thing to kind of remember is many HCCs are affecting severity and mortality, and many diagnoses that affect severity and mortality are also HCCs. So you can kind of-ish say the more HCCs I get, <laughs> Sometimes the better my severity of illness looks, um, and again, in this Medicaid world where the state pays on it, the, the better my reimbursement is. But again, every HCC is not going to affect severity and payment, but it's definitely used, again, to influence uh, those negotiated rates or expected spending. Okay, will the CPT book ever go away since we are moving towards a value-based world? Uh, my understanding, again, for physician payment, I've not seen enough out there where I don't think it's going away. Do I think it's going to undergo a little bit of an overhaul? I do think it's going through that. Again, this is not my um, strongest area of expertise, but from everything that I've read from my coworkers and seen in the industry, I don't believe that's the case. But I don't, again, I don't want to underestimate the effect that uh, HCCs are in explaining the cost that we're um, representing through APCs or CPTs. And you know, I, I can't imagine that book is going away any more than DRGs. We're still going to have DRGs and some sort of DRG-based payment. The difference is we're just going to get less or more of those DRG-based payments in our uh, inpatient world. And I think similar things will happen in the CPT and APC world. Yeah, the next question is, how can providers leverage improvements in HCC scores to capture increased reimbursement for managed care payers as RAP scores increase? Oh, that's actually an easy one. And uh, where I'm at um, in the East Coast, those insurers know more about the physicians than the physicians do about their payment, their costs, their costs in layers and outliers. And if we're not getting enough of those HCCs, our physicians look like cost outliers. And they can be kicked out of networks, and they have in the Northeast been kicked out of um, a network in Rhode Island and Connecticut because they were the, the common denominator, all the physicians that were excluded from the network, was that they were cost outliers. And again, as they're working with that network, working with that a, uh, ACO organization as a member of an ACO, uh, those HCCs are influencing and supporting. And when the ACO has a shared savings and a shared win and it's distributed to the physicians, the physicians are getting that more money as well. So, uh, you know, depending on that cost sharing arrangement the physician has in that ACO or APM, it's certainly influencing payment. And again, HCCs are the influencers. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. That's all the time we have today. 
If we did not get to your question, we will follow up with you via email. Just a reminder that an email will be sent to event registrants with a link to the archive, so look for that in your inbox in the next few days. I would like to thank Cheryl and thank all of you for joining us. This concludes this 3M Health Information Systems webinar. Thank <laughs> you.